All right. What is happening, team? It's your host, Coach Hawk, with Anabolic Radio and Hawk Fit Coaching and Legion Athletics. And I'm joined today by Zach Robinson from Data Driven Strength. And he is also currently finishing up his PhD. And for the basis of this episode, we'll pretty much be basing it around training to failure and we'll branch off into different subsections of that. Uh, Zach recently published this systematic review and meta regression, I believe it was. And um, uh, systematic review? Technically, no. <laughs> Technically, no. Okay. Pretty, pretty, pretty non-systematic, actually. It was pretty, no. uh, pretty uh, kind of just uh, exploring stuff. So, yeah. Okay, cool. And um, so, without further ado, why don't you give the audience a little bit of an intro about yourself, and um, we'll go from there. Sure. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, my name is Zach Robinson. Currently doing my PhD at Florida Atlantic University. Um, I actually did my master's kind of focused on proximity to failure and, and stuff like that. So this was kind of a run over project that was kind of uh, started at the tail end of my master's. PhD is actually focused on kind of the individual response related to training and some uh, different you know ways we can kind of investigate that. So that's another one of my interests. But other than that, I spent a lot of my time uh, trying my best at least to uh, you know do the science communication thing where we take the the research and break that down for you know your everyday lifters. Um, to try to make training more efficient and hopefully uh, help optimize outcomes. So, yeah, it's quick and dirty. Nice, man. Uh, that's interesting that you're doing your PhD on that topic. Uh, have you learned anything interesting in the process? I think the the number one thing about that topic is there is, you know, even I have made a ton of claims on the data that we have that I think are probably not super robust. Um, there are some pretty specific methodologies that need to be utilized in order to make like pretty, uh, you know, uh, cautious, but also robust claims about individualization and how, how we can do all those kind of things. And um, my, my dissertation project is, is one of those designs. And I can tell you from firsthand experience, it is, uh, it is probably the, you know, training studies are a ton of work and, and I've done a few of those at this point, but um, this is a whole nother level. Basically the, I guess the, the, the short version of it is in order to, to really robustly look at individual response and, and for kind of the stuff that we care about um, is do individuals respond better to one protocol versus the other? That kind of that kind of concept is, is what I'm particularly interested in. You really need to have people repeat a training intervention. So, you know, you take a standard training study and now you're basically doubling it. Um, that can get uh, laborious to, to say the least in order to, uh, to, to to finish that kind of stuff. But yeah, I think I think the number one thing I'd say right now is there's really just not much that we know based on the data that we have. We have a lot of descriptive data in terms of, you know, a wide variety of responses to, to different things, different protocols protocols, um, just generally to resistance training, but in order to actually, you know, first and foremost, investigate, does this happen robustly? But two, the, the probably the most interesting thing to, to it's kind of our audience is, can we predict this kind of stuff? So that that's, that's kind of what my dissertation is focusing on, um, you know, about halfway through right now. So hopefully we can efficiently get through that and, and end up with some cool stuff, but we'll see. Awesome, man. Congrats. I'm excited to see that. And I think, um, you know, it's incredibly important and it's going to be a great piece of work because oftentimes when people tend to look towards the literature for answers, um, I think they, and especially if they're not really um, great at interpreting literature, they forget that most literature only reports the average and there's outliers on both ends of the spectrum yep. and uh, with a lot of the literature that's out it doesn't really give us any sort of definitive concrete answers it just kind of points us in a general direction of where we should be going or how we could structure protocols and um, there's a huge degree of individual variance with how people will respond to that so I'm excited to see that <laughs> um, and uh, when it comes to the recent paper on training to failure. Sure. Um, why don't we go ahead and give the audience a little bit of a background with regards to the design and structure of it? Sure. Yeah. So, so this kind of project was um, kind of birthed out of a lot of conversations, um, you know, between members of our lab, kind of talking about the the topic of proximity to failure and some of the although, you know, the best we can do, inherent limitations of the way that's kind of been investigated. 
So, you know, a lot of the research is kind of focused on, you know, sort of categorical comparisons of proximity to failure. So training to failure versus not to failure, or um, there's different ways you can kind of organize that. The most recent meta-analysis, which is extremely well done, um, kind of broke that up in a, a little bit more granular with the different definitions of failure. But nonetheless, it's still kind of a categorical comparison. Um, when we're looking to kind of the ideal uh, analysis related to proximity to failure is to understand the dose response relationship. Um, and so when we kind of started talking about that and, and ultimately wanted to try to approximate that the best we could, we kind of started going down this path of, okay, what are the necessary steps that need to be made in order to have an analysis that basically gives us this dose response relationship rather than a categorical comparison of A versus B. Now we're kind of plotting all the different RERs um, along the spectrum to kind of compare outcomes that way. Um, and so what you're left with is a whole lot of uh, estimating that needs to be done ultimately. So we, we basically took all of the studies that we think um, kind of either directly or indirectly kind of relate to the topic of proximity to failure and its relationship to hypertrophy and strength gains. And we developed a systematic but inherently subjective way of estimating the RER for each one of those studies. Some of them are really straightforward. For example, um, one uh, one kind of bucket of studies that that is kind of involved in this is is using the studies that do train to failure and then have a non-failure group. So an example there would be, you know, one group trains three sets of 10 to some sort of reported failure definition, and they use X weight. If the other group is using the same load, and they did sets of five instead of sets of 10, it's a simple subtraction problem, 10 minus five, and the average RAR of the non-failure group there would be five. And so some of them are pretty straightforward like that. And then you get into some of the more complex relationships where we use some estimation equations and stuff based on some uh, published research, uh, such as the velocity loss studies, or also studies that only reported the number of reps performed and the load that they utilize. And so then we try to find the, the best predictions equations in the literature based on the exercise, the sex, the load used, um, even the maximal, the concentric intended velocity, a couple things like that, to try to find these prediction equations that could at least give us some approximation of the maximum possible number of reps. And then you just subtract the amount of reps that they did, and that can give you a rough uh, RAR estimation. Now, the thing I've been trying to communicate as best as I can, kind of going around the um, the, the community is just to underline how big of a limitation that is. Um, obviously, I wouldn't have done this project if I don't think it at least can inform us in some way, but it is nonetheless, it, 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 that's a red, kind of red highlighter, uh, kind of very first piece you kind of need to understand to conceptualize these results appropriately. Um, because obviously we don't know the true accuracy of those RER estimations, which essentially is the bedrock foundation of the entire analysis. Um, now, once again, I think with all, the, all those things in mind, I still think it can be useful in kind of providing us a, a, a general heuristic to to kind of move forward with. But that said, it is a pretty big limitation. And if somebody kind of looks at our RR estimation procedures, doesn't agree with certain certain uh, parts of it, um, and, and I would be very open to many of the limitations that are part of that. Just to, to kind of go through one, I guess, to kind of give the listeners some context would be, let's say that we're um, looking at a study that reports the load and the number of reps they perform. So three sets of 10 on the back squat at 70% of 1RM. When we utilize those prediction equations, there's a few things that we're assuming, right? We're assuming that individuals perform repetitions roughly the same at a given percentage of 1RM, which we know probably isn't true. We know sexes are probably part of that, which we tried to account for the best we could in the prediction equations, but that kind of magnifies that individual difference component. That's going to be different uh, based on the exercise. We couldn't find prediction equations for every single exercise in a training program, so I had to kind of uh, double count some occasionally. And um, that probably is going to change set to set as well as you, as you fatigue and things like that. So we had to do um, different kind of compromises like that in order to find kind of the average RAR that people trained at and did the best we could with all the limitations that I just outlined. So all I'm saying there is that before we even kind of get to the next couple parts of this, it's just important to take these results with a grain of salt, understanding that the RARs are estimated. And I think viewing this analysis as providing us a general framework to understand the dose response relationship of these adaptations with RIR is probably the best way to view it. So when I talk about kind of the, the takeaways, it's usually that this outcome is related in this fashion roughly with RIR, and that's basically the very confident statements would basically stop there. Other than that, you would have to kind of assume that all of the things that we've done are going to be spot on, which we know that they're probably not. So that's that's the very first thing I kind of say. So after we have all those RR estimations, 
then we can kind of move on to the actual analysis part. And so this is where you can probably compare what we did to more traditional meta-analysis. So meta-analysis, broadly speaking, you're taking the results of many studies, kind of pulling those together to get an overall effect estimate that can kind of tell the story of the research, basically. And so you're using different statistical techniques to account for the differences in sample size, the difference in the variance of the outcomes, and, and, and uh, different uh, structures of the data where multiple outcomes are coming from a given study, et cetera, like that. So you're using some of those um, techniques rather than just taking the average of all the studies, for example. It's a little bit more um, involved in that. So a, a traditional meta-analysis you would probably kind of come across is, is one where you'll see a, what's called a forest plot where you have all the different uh, standardized mean differences that kind of line up around this central line. And you'll see the nice diamond at the bottom. That's kind of the summary effect size that uh, most people will be familiar with. What we did is fundamentally it's the same exact process as as a, as a normal meta-analysis we're just adding in um in, in our case multiple what are called moderators which were basically plotting those effect sizes against the RER relationship in this case so fundamentally it's a very similar process there are a few other statistical adjustments you have to do when you're making um, comparisons within studies rather than between groups within the same study um, but you know that that kind of uh, put out of the way that allows us to get access to this overall dose response relationship um, that we're kind of after in the first place. So that's roughly what we did. And then from there, once we fit kind of a few different models, which um, that 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 part of it is also a little bit um, important to outline. I, I come back to the fact that I think it's good to view the general principles of kind of what we did and understand this general relationship and the directionality, as I think a lot of people have have really overinterpreted the directionality of the actual uh, relationship. So we fit both linear and nonlinear models to which there are multiple different iterations of each that we could have fit that we might add into the actual published version to kind of fit some of the other shapes that people are uh, interested in. But ultimately, um, the then we kind of had a, a model comparison procedure, which basically takes all those different models, the different shapes that those are um, resulting, and kind of spits out the one that's the quote-unquote best fit. Um, the ultimate thing I like to say there as well is that people can value different things in, in model comparison procedures. So some people may view simplicity a little bit more um, higher level, such that a linear trend is something that you would kind of value because that takes the, uh, the least number of terms in the model, basically. It's called parsimony. It just keeps things simple. And usually that's going to have a positive effect when new de data kind of enters the equation. Whereas the more nonlinear these models get, the more kind of curves in the line, you start overfitting the data, the less kind of predictive long term that tends to become. So those are kind of some of the things we're dealing with. Nonetheless, the uh, um, models end up kind of uh, getting compared and we spit out these kind of best fit models. And then that's kind of the the rundown of the overall analysis. And those are the ones we kind of reported in the paper. We also did a sensitivity analysis where we there was a really long tail of RERs that has been kind of criticized to, to some degree. I understand it. Um, we were just going with all the RERs that we estimated all the way up to like 23 RER. But we did a sensitivity analysis where we only analyzed uh, the effects from 0 to 10 um, and did that as well in the same exact procedure. So. Yeah, so that's kind of the general rundown of what we did. I don't know if you have any other specific questions that I missed or if you kind of want to head into the outcomes. Was there, was there uh, off the top, do you uh, remember how many studies you guys included? For uh, strength, it was in the fifth, low 50s. And then for hypertrophy, I want to say it was in the mid 20s for the kind of the overall relationship, which importantly, I think for the hypertrophy discussion in particular, uh, that has been, I think, the reason a lot of people are kind of seeing this relationship as potentially counterintuitive. Um, I actually don't think that's the case, kind of looking at all the research collectively. I think it fits pretty well um, with, the, with the overall findings that have come previously. But nonetheless, I think the number of studies that are included in this are just considerably greater than kind of other relevant uh, failure versus non-failure meta-analyses, just because we've had access now through the estimation procedures of this RAR variable that can put these studies a little bit more on an even playing field. Um, so we incorporated things directly into the same analysis, like the velocity loss studies, which have been analyzed se separately, and then also some of the alternative set structure research, which basically uses, you know, little mini rest periods to manipulate the proximity to failure of a set. So all those were kind of included in this analysis, which gave us access to some more studies studies, which, you know, you can view in, in kind of two directions. You, you could argue that that results in uh, some other confounding variables, which we did try to adjust for in the statistical modeling. But nonetheless, um, someone could value studies that are very, very set up specifically based on the way that they train, the loads that they use, that kind of thing. Um, and, and, and so that there's uh, there's trade-offs there. But I think overall, the increasing the number of studies for those areas that I think kind of can inform us on, on proximity to failure, I think was a, a benefit overall.
that in itself seems like a very daunting task and <laughs> go through each study itself sure. and then, you know, <laughs> separate them. So with regards to the outcomes, why don't we go ahead and dive into the findings for strength and then we could dive into the findings for hypertrophy. Sure. So I think the strength ones are relatively simple. Um, ironically, that, that's kind of why I did this project in the first place. I come from a little bit more of a strength back, background, definitely interested in hypertrophy as well, but um, that was kind of the, the reason I did this in the first place, but those have gotten talked about essentially zero, so it's, it's funny. Um, but uh, for strength, basically what we found is when you adjust for, I think, the biggest player, and that is the, the load in which you're using on a given set. And so if I'm using, let's say, 75% of my 1RM, basically there becomes a negligible relationship with RIR which ultimately suggests that load is probably the predominant variable when it comes to, to, to strength. Um, and then additional intraset fatigue, once you're at a given load, doesn't seem to really augment strength gains any um, uh, further. If anything, it might slightly diminish them, but the overall relationship was negligible, so I wouldn't say that super confidently. Um, and so from a practical perspective, I think that, and there's actually a, a, a more recent uh, dose-response relationship meta-analysis that came out um, by Swinton and colleagues that looks at the dose-response relationship with load and, and uh, strength gains and shows a very positive relationship, which basically augments our findings in, indirectly um, that would just say that for strength, uh, 1RM strength, uh, prioritizing load over proximity to failure probably seems to make sense. And so if you think about it this way, at least from a practical perspective, this is how I think about it, is everybody has a given fatigue budget. We can spend on it uh, on the different variables. For strength specifically, it's probably best to kind of put the majority of that fatigue budget into the load uh, kind of category and then a little bit into volume, obviously. And then maybe proximity to failure becomes kind of a lower tier variable where you're just kind of working around everything else. The, the one tricky thing with this for strength is that if I increase the load, that results in a reduction in proximity to failure, the minimum obtainable proximity to failure. So there's two different ways that RAR can change, and that's load mediated or intraset fatigue mediated. The former means that the bar is going to slow down because it's really, really heavy. And so as I get closer to a single at a zero RIR or single at a 10 RPE, that bar starts to slow down. However, within a set, after I've selected a load, let's say 100 pounds, if I continuously do reps, that bar is going to slow for a different reason. It's no longer because it's necessarily heavy, it's because you're accumulating fatigue within a set, and that seems to result in velocity decline, which we speculate in kind of the discussion that that may be kind of... Uh, related to the principle of specificity in that you're producing the most absolute whole muscle force on that very first rep, which you're going to decline throughout a set. So for strength specifically, that may seem to be kind of a contra a contradiction to the principle of specificity, but for hypertrophy, that's where we'll kind of get into things where I think things change a little bit. So as far as strength goes, you any questions there? Yeah. yeah. So outside of, um, so the variables that are going to main variables that are going to influence that are going to be the force velocity relationship and sure. Henman size principle. Are there any other variables outside of that that influence it? In in terms of kind of like my speculated model of kind of how I think about strength. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's uh, it's tough. This is a, this is a tough question. Obviously, this is more my speculation hat on, researcher hat off. I I think the things you mentioned are kind of the way that I think about it. The Force velocity relationship, I think, is tough because there are those kind of two competing things. The force velocity relationship is often discussed in the context of single repetitions or single uh, contractions, and then that becomes very obvious. But within a set, particularly on the whole muscle level, I think this is where it gets kind of challenging to think about because you're literally producing less force on every single repetition if you're moving every single repetition with maximal concentric intended velocity. Um, so for strength, I view that theoretically as a negative thing um, in, a, in an absolute sense, I guess, from the principle of specificity. Obviously, if you integrate hypertrophy into strength, it gets a little bit more complicated, but just talking about um, strength and isolation at the moment, accumulating that intraset fatigue may not be beneficial because when you come to the next set or the next session or what have you, your uh, total ability to produce force may be declined. And we know from the, a lot of the acute research that that accumulating that intraset fatigue seems to be negative in terms of your performance ability, you know, in the relatively short term. And if strength, the kind of the name of the game is to lift really heavy loads similar to the task you want to improve relatively frequently, relatively consistently, that's basically what you're trying to optimize for is how do I get sufficient practice with the movement at a very specific overall loading range such that I can repeat that 
as frequently as possible. I think is kind of the optimization game you're playing in your head. And then you layer on, you know, individual sensitivities as far as injuries and, and, and recovery to curves and all those kind of things. And that kind of pops out your program. Um, from the mechanistic aspect, I think the two things that you mentioned, um, Ultimately, the, the the size principle seems to you know correlate relatively well with with the load, and then um, the force velocity relationship, like we like we already touched on. So, as you're getting closer to that 100% of one RM, the more motor units are going to be recruited, uh, assumingly, um, and then the force velocity relationship kind of takes over from there. Mm, great points, great points, and I think um, that further alludes to the fact that uh, strength is specific. So you have to develop the qualities of expressing that strength and really structuring your programming in a way to help you express those adaptations is incredibly important for that goal. Um, so when it comes to hypertrophy, and um, for some of the audience listening, if you haven't seen the paper, go check it out, get those numbers up. And um, <laughs> there was an inflection point right around one to two RIR. So I'd love to hear uh, your thoughts on that. Sure. Yeah. So I think the, like I said, the, the number one thing to kind of underline there is like, I don't hold to that exact curve very strongly. Um, I think a very reasonable person could look at the different model fits and say, I prefer this relationship over this relationship. Um, maybe we didn't fit some that, that they would uh, prefer. And like I said, I, hopefully we're going to integrate that into the published version. Um, and, I view that as more as, okay, there's a positive relationship with training closer to failure and getting better hypertrophy. And failure provides a uncertain amount of additional benefit, if that makes sense. But we seem to be relatively consistent that the relationship is positive. Um, now, again, inter over kind of interpreting that curve, I think is a, is a challenging task because if you think about the estimations again, if a few of those estimations are off in a little bit of a direction, a few of those effect sizes could bounce slightly differently and that curve, could, the, the, the best fit curve could change. And so that's why I, I tend to view it more holistically from the model pers modeling perspective in the, in the sense that, you know, essentially all the models show the same general pr pattern. It's just the, the strength of which those, you know, kind of curves uh, differ is, is slightly different. Um, so in terms of over interpreting the inflection point, I, I don't, think about it that way i don't think this is a although i've been uh, assigned this position that i don't really hold I don't, I don't think this is like a capital f endorsement of failure um, i think it suggests that um, there may be an additional stimulus to be gained from going there but how often you should go there how that's contextualizing your training program all of those different nuances like i've seen some interpretations of this to say that like this is this suggests that you have to do it this way like i, I don't i don't view it that really at all like to me it's a conceptual understanding that there may be additional benefits to be gained as we get closer to failure which may extend to failure and then we use that for with our coaching lens and all the other you know data that we have available in addition to our own clients experience to then interface that on a actually writing out a training program so i would say that's really the biggest thing to understand that. And I think another thing to, to keep in mind is just the interaction that we saw with, with load as well. So kind of the, the heavier the loading ranges that you go, somewhere, I, I use this roughly because we use percentage of 1RM, not RM zones, but roughly a 5 to 8 RM and heavier, I would say, you don't need to go quite as close to failure, which kind of makes sense from the two mechanisms that you kind of alluded to in, uh, in the strength results too. Um, so I think that is kind of how I view the overall relationship. Hey, it seems that there's a positive relationship between this variable. Thus, we should kind of use that in the cost benefit analysis when we're actually programming things. And we can use that in its relationship with load as well to be a little bit more nuanced. The other thing to touch on is the relationship to volume. That's really the biggest one. I think that's got the kind of the most chatter. I don't think that this analysis in any way kind of suggests that you must be of the approach of, you know, very low volumes, take every set to failure. Like, I don't, I don't think that's really a valid inference from this research. To me, what we did is we just tried to account for, you know, volume differences. In one of the moderator analyses that was in the supplementary materials, we saw that when we uh, allowed for kind of looking at the different curves of the different number of adjusted sets per week. Then we saw that higher volumes seem to have a slightly diminished slope, but they did result in higher outcomes. So basically the, my interpretate, interpretation from that is there's probably many roads to roam here such that if you go a little bit submax one in the RIR department, you can do a few more sets to make up for that or vice versa. And so then the actual uh, application of that on the individual level is going to be up to the coach and the client and what seems to make sense given their individual situation. So to me, that's really what it comes down to is understanding these basic general overall 
frameworks to which we can evaluate other evidence and also our experience through. And it seems to be that strength overall seems to have a negligible relationship with proximity to failure when the load is equated. And then for hypertrophy, there seems to be a relatively meaningful relationship. Um, although the overall model fit was was not super great, I still think it from a practical perspective means that those are those are two uh it's a, it's a variable that's pretty strongly related to outcomes so then we can from there use that information to kind of do all the all the stuff that coaches need to do to actually you know write a program for a client mm, great points and we're 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 all our own toughest critics right there you i go. appreciate sure. <laughs> your uh your wanting to want to make it better right that's what makes uh, some of the literature give us a little bit better answer so Although um, RPE, RIR, rating of perceived exertion repetitions in reserve is sort of a subjective skill, I do think it's incredibly valuable for helping us identify our proximity to failure. Mm -hmm. And I think when many people have the goal of trying to train to failure, understanding the difference between task, mechanical, muscle, Momentary muscle failure and technical failure is incredibly important. So momentary muscular failure, when you're failing an extra exercise related to the target muscle, that is the limiting factor. Whereas technical failure, you know, you're failing in a movement related to your technique or execution or, you know, you misgroove during a set uh, or a rep. So I think um, oftentimes some people tend to put themselves in a box with regards to that scaling. So for example, like when I train with some people in person, which is very rare, um, and I, I tell them, you know, take the set to an RPE of nine, RIR of one, and they take it there and we get to the end of the set and then I get in their ear, they could bang out like five more. So in your opinion, when people have the goal of trying to train to failure, do you think that they can put themselves in a box with regards to understanding where that limit really lies? Yeah, I mean, this is this exposes so many uh, questions and, and limitations of this area of research that I think are important to keep in mind is ultimately the, the way that we define failure is incredibly important. And I think that has been like pretty well elucidated in, in the, a few of the review papers that we have on this topic. But I do think it kind of expands even further than some of the things that we've measured already. So you, you mentioned a few things already, like the difference between technical failure and momentary failure, that is going to be very apparent on something like a squat, for example. But a uh, leg press, they may be identical, um, the, depending on the degrees of freedom. So like even that comparison is dependent on other additional factors that kind of seep into this kind of question. Um, and then, you know, something I've been appreciating more recently with a lot of the talk around range of motion is kind of how that plays into the equation as well. Um, depending on the actual exercise selection, the resistance profile, those kind of things, the task failure can present very differently. And ultimately then it becomes a question of how do we define the task? And then how does defining the task in a different way ultimately influence outcomes? All of those things are kind of areas where I just kind of shrug my hands up and say, we know how things have been roughly defined. And that's usually going to be um, associated with task failure of a full range of motion repetition. And some studies are better at providing the parameters in which they're defining failure. Other studies basically say it's volitional and that's entirely up to the the subject's perception of of what fit, what that means and that's often not explained to the subject so it gets even more ambiguous. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of questions associated with ultimately how is that set endpoint being defined? And I think as we've kind of had more conversations around, you know, the range of motion stuff is the thing that's the freshest on my mind. I think that gets even fuzzier um, with ultimately how we kind of define that stuff. But from a practical perspective, like you mentioned, I do think it's important to kind of anchor the way that you're programming to some sort of definition. Um, and I think that's ultimately going to result in a lot of different ways that that can be executed. You know, a technical a technical failure on a, on a squat that's being executed in a very specific way to target the quads is going to be very different than a power lifter doing an AMRAP set where as literally as long as you go, go below player low and all the joints are locked out at the top, those are two very different uh, tasks that you're evaluating. So I think the, the failure definitions need to be accommodating to what you're trying to do. And then the other thing is, like you mentioned, I think the kind of the psychological state in which you're kind of doing that as well needs to be kind of standardized to the best you can. So like, you know, I know there's a lot of people that really enjoy kind of 
kind of the ethos of training to failure, if that makes sense. Like they generally do lower volumes and they really look forward to that one set and they really like to get a ton of arousal before that set. That's a different type of fatigue, at least in my experience that comes from, you know, snorting pneumonia, running up to the, to the hack squat, you know, screaming, grunting, that kind of thing. than somebody that says it's, you know, 12:43 PM on a Tuesday afternoon, I haven't had caffeine, Taylor Swift's in my headphones and we're going to take <laughs> this, this hack squat to zero RAR. That's a two kind of not comparable things in, in my mind, even if the latter person reaches truly a point of not being able to perform another repetition. I think those are just kind of different. And that's something I've noticed that maybe is something we could be a little bit more explicit in programming, just kind of rough arousal states of like how a session should be approached. If that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Um, just kind of keep that, trying to keep that as as consistent as possible, I think can influence RAR accuracy, even outside of being able to uh, accomplish another rep, if that makes sense. So, yeah, I think my answer to your question is those are good points and I don't really have a good answer. And it's, there's so many things that kind of go into the way that we define failure and then all the proxy evaluations thereof at submaximal RARs get a little bit messy. Mm. I love how you mentioned the psychological component of things, because when I have a grueling lower body session planned, uh, the preparation for that literally starts a day in advance. I have to start that self-talk in my head. And um, I think the individualization component for, for coaches to clients is incredibly important. So, for example, just establishing a rapport and understanding where your client's head is in terms of their ability to take a set to failure will help break past potential bottlenecks in terms of their ability to improve their strength or hypertrophy. Um, so whether that be a lower volume, higher intensity based approach or higher volume, lower intensity based approach, um, it's incredibly important to not, you know, think one size fits all just because this new paper is demonstrating these findings. And previously you, you mentioned, um, volume and, um, volume and intensity tend to have a interconnected relationship they're influenced by each other so i would love to hear your thoughts on volume and how that sort of influences it and and when when i say volume i'm primarily not talking about um load times reps times set sets. Volume. Yeah. set volume yeah Got how it. many sets you're doing per muscle group per week cool yeah this, this is the tough one i think um so I guess I'll give two answers. I guess my my most cautious answer and the answer that I think is probably the most accurate at the moment is like this analysis just simply can't inform the question of which should be prioritized. That 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 concept of like saying that, you know, I've seen people kind of talk about comparing the slopes of RAR versus the one reported in other research for volume. Um, that even if a slope is different there, I don't know if that like implies that one should be prioritized versus the other. So ultimately, the way that I kind of view it is, like most things, the, the answer probably is somewhere in the middle. So I think if you're like absolutely redlining it on either extreme, just pure logic and experience would tell me that's probably not the best approach. Like we know that both of these variables seem to be important. And even in our analysis, the, the overall outcomes were a little bit higher with higher volumes. So that seems to be uh, important. But we know that you probably aren't going to be able to recover and benefit from 35 sets a week, taking every single one to, to momentary failure, right? So it's probably somewhere in the middle. So the way that I like to think about it is, for the most part, I think it makes sense to kind of optimize for set quality first. And there's going to be a range in which that's going to be acceptable. You don't have to say every set needs to be taken to failure. You could, but you don't necessarily have to, from my from my opinion. We still get positive outcomes from a wide range of RARs, so you don't have to, you know, shoehorn yourself into one of those. But I think somewhere, you know, it, close like close to failure, there's going to be a range. I'm going to refrain from giving numbers because I think that's misleading a lot of the times. But you know, being being most of your sets relatively close to failure, and then I think optimizing training volume around that makes makes sense to me. And then kind of just going um, with uh, whatever your your recovery patterns and your performance kind of suggest. And then you kind of have those two levers to play with. If both are kind of in a moderate uh, direction to start, and uh, you'll you'll be able to take a few sets closer to failure if that's what you feel like you need when you hit a plateau, or you'll be able to increase your set volume a little bit, or vice versa, and play with different combinations around those reasonable ranges, rather than you know I'm doing two sets a week to uh, you know forced reps, you know 
partners, you know, lifting it off me, eccentric overload, all that kind of stuff. Like you could do that. I, I mean, it sounds interesting, but I don't think that was be the direction that I would go, nor would I go to very far from failure, tons of sets. I think the answer probably is somewhere in the middle. Now, from a, I guess if you literally take the slopes that were reported in our paper, at least the preprint um, as of now, and the, the, the published research on volume, I think you can get some rough approximations of kind of what we're talking about seem to optimize outcomes. Um, and, and so roughly speaking, if you kind of do a little bit of math, it would seem like around eight sets per week to failure versus like 16 sets to like around three RIR, something like that, seem to be in the ballpark of one another which kind of meets the eye test to me. I think that kind of kind of makes sense. And so, you know, that kind of gives you a general range to kind of play with of like how you're going to kind of bounce those things around. Um, so ultimately speaking, I guess to answer your question directly, volume absolutely still matters. Um, and I think that compromising your ability to accumulate a good amount of work within a week by thinking that the paper suggests you have to take every set to failure, I don't think is a smart idea, nor do I think that kind of taking, you know, our research as well as some previously other published analyses, I think you should have be relatively close to failure for hypertrophy and then kind of scale set volume around that to make sure your set quality is high initially and then kind of scale, uh, scale, uh, training volume to kind of meet your recovery needs. That's so that's kind of how I view it. Um, not a super direct answer and there's a lot of interpretation to be had there, but I think that uh, hopefully kind of provides my, my thinking on it. No, I love how you said uh, keep quality of work a, uh, a high. So typically when I program for clients and even for myself, um, set range is within the minimum recommendation, which is eight to 12 sets per muscle group per week. And um, then based on individual responses, how they're recovering and where I think their head is at, I kind of give general recommendations for when they should be taking, you know, sets to failure or when they should be pulling back from their training. And um, I, I uh, I loved how you previously mentioned how, because this is a hot topic right now, range of motion, muscle lengths, um, how it is going to vary based on the exercise and the resistance profile uh, for that exercise. So um, let's say, for example, you know, failure is going to look different in something like a bicep curl. Um, whereas, you know, it's going to look very different in something like a leg press or a hack squat. So I'd love to get your thoughts on how exercise selection and, um, the resistance profile of an exercise, how that's going to influence failure. Sure. So I think the first thing to say is that I think a lot of the anecdotes associated with like, I don't think I need to take multi-joint exercises as close to failure. I think that's probably getting picked up in our analysis in that the the load interaction so generally speaking people are probably going to load multi-joint exercises heavier than single joint exercises and i would say just purely by logistics those are going to be the ones that kind of fall closer to that you know that five to eight rm range that you're kind of using most of the time and i think that's where that kind of anecdote kind of fits so that's the first thing i'd say kind of the whole multi-joint versus single joint thing is if you're using heavy loads which is typically going to be on multi-joint exercises it doesn't seem that you have to be as close to failure to maximize outcomes um, as far as the resistance profile stuff, that's the, that's the tricky one. So initially I was going to, excuse me, try to roughly approximate kind of the exercise selection used in the, in the, uh, studies within the analysis. But then as I was kind of realizing when I was going through it, I was basically just making total assumptions on kind of the way the machines worked. And I was just purely using my experience that like, okay, most leg extension machines seem, seem to be hard towards the top, that kind of thing. And, and kind of just assuming that. So that would be essentially an entirely made up analysis that I'm just going on based on my personal experience. I refrain from doing that formally, but if I'm just looking at the kind of the papers associated with the analysis and kind of just subjectively kind of looking at things, it tends to be the exercises that are challenging and expose the muscle to a longer length and, and most challenging down there probably usually are the ones that are, you don't have to go quite as close to failure to optimize outcomes, which I think probably starts to paint. So the, the whole goal of this project again was kind of to try to develop this spectrum of RAR rather than A versus B. Oh, whoops. And so I think traditionally how I would have thought about it, you know, six months ago or so is, you know, we define the task and, and that's, that's zero RER and failure. And that kind of, we stop there. I think if you view it more from a muscular perspective and kind of remove yourself from like the task constraints a little bit, I think you can kind of expand that zero RER failure spectrum a little bit more in that 
failing an exercise more kind of that short position is maybe closer to that true zero RIR. And then when typically when you fail exercise in that position, you have more force to give more, more range of motion, which you can still kind of actively work within. And then maybe as you get closer to those length and failure exercises, you tend to be at a greater degree of physiological exhaustion that may kind of create an additional spectrum down towards the failure end of the kind of RER continuum that may kind of pick up on some of these things. So within the submaximal RER continuum, because you're working with a length and exercise that's really challenging in that position, the whole thing might kind of be scooted down a little bit in which you won't need to go as close to failure to optimize outcomes in comparison to an exercise that's maybe more challenging in a short position, if that makes sense. So that's those are very speculative thoughts, but that's kind of where I'm thinking at the moment um, in terms of, you know, actually, if I have to write down a program today, I would kind of have that maybe a little bit in my mind. Um, that said, we need definitely need direct research on that topic. And I think that would be a very interesting study if anyone's listening for one to do is get your hands on one of those nice pieces of prime equipment and look at different kind of degrees of failure and kind of RARs associated with each of those tasks. And I think that would be very interesting to kind of take a look at and, and, and see how that kind of influences outcomes directly. But other than that, we're just kind of spitballing for the moment. And that, that would be kind of where I'd put my, put my tentative money, I guess, if we're using the betting analogy. Mm, Got to get you to N1 HQ. <laughs> they got a lot of cool toys. That sounds, sounds like a, sounds like a good gig. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I appreciate how level headed you are when it comes to communicating about these topics and um, when it comes to things such as strength or hypertrophy, I know we we love the literature and you know it giving us a little bit of a better direction with how we should go about programming or structuring things. And I think it um, sort of become, became a bit more popularized when um, misinformation became like a super big thing. A lot of people started to gravitate towards the literature and they think, Oh my God, this paper is giving me all the answers when it's really not. So how much do you think that um, the current body of literature has influenced people's uh, training when it comes to strength-based training or even hypertrophy training? And um, if so, um, is there a, a huge significance in terms of how people approach their training, let's say like 20 years ago versus now? This is a tough one. Um, <laughs> I guess sometimes I can be overly philosophical. So tell me if I'm if I'm being such. But the first the first thing I would say is it's important to define what you mean by kind of influencing training. So to me, the biggest thing that research has probably done has kind of eliminated bad options more than anything. Um, so, for example. Um, German volume training, maybe, for, for example, like doing excessively high volumes probably isn't a good idea. But if we didn't have any of the research, you see that program on bodybuilding.com, you are probably more likely to, you know, to give it a shot. And I'm not saying that can't be effective. I'm not saying that can't be maybe even really good for somebody. But I would say that that has been the real role of research in my mind is it kind of takes the natural kind of trial and error process and kind of put some guardrails on it so that it's more efficient. Now, does that actually lead to very different long-term outcomes? I think that's debatable. I think that's one of the biggest questions that I have just even conceptually is like, does doing these things that we think optimize, you know, outcomes, outcome, uh, optimize hypertrophy in the, in the short to moderate term, strength to short to moderate term, does that actually get us to a different point or does that just get us there faster? I think that's in kind of a a discussion that's interesting and, and, and definitely could be argued um, in either direction. But I think that's really the main role of kind of research is it kind of gives us two things. It hopefully mm -hmm. eliminates really bad options from, from the table that would make the troubleshooting process for an individual very, very inefficient and maybe even tell them to get out of training um, and not stay with it for the long term to kind of find their, their, uh, their selves all the way up their own individual tree because they saw so poor outcomes initially that they just decided that wasn't for them. Um, by eliminating some of those really, really bad options that have a pretty darn low probability of being effective, I think that's gonna allow more people to stick with things long-term, which we know is the most important kind of variable for, for progression, right? Mm -hmm. It's just, if you train for 25 years, you're probably gonna get where you're gonna get, and then maybe some of these other things can kind of 
at a couple percent in either direction, right? So I think that's the main thing I'd say. Other than that, I would say that kind of understanding scientific methodology processes and ultimately what is going to result in a valid inference, I think is probably the biggest thing other than that. And so what I mean by that is as a coach or as a someone who's, who's training is you have to be able to understand and try your best to assign causality to, to interventions that are benefiting you or not benefiting you. That's basically saying, let's make the trial and error process actually a good one instead of assigning, you know, okay, I, I, I changed my training program, but I also had 37 other things that changed and I'm assigning my training program to the positive benefits that I saw. And that's where obviously it gets challenging on the individual level because it's really hard to have to know what would have happened in the in the alternative scenario because we have time that's constantly progressing. So that's where just fundamentally having uh, individual level observations can be challenging. But even working within that framework, understanding some scientific methodology, how research works, how you try to you know control for confounders, et cetera can make you try to have as much confidence in your individual level observations as possible. And so I think that is probably the second benefit of just understanding that process and appreciating how to go about making observations and record keeping and trying to understand what is actually resulting in a change, moving minimal variables, trying to control your lifestyle as much as possible when you're trying to make changes. All those kind of things I think are probably a large amount of the benefit, but I think the potentially slightly controversial opinion is, again, coming back from my perspective, is I think it's probably unanswered the degree of individualization that occurs truly from a physiological level rather than a lot of these external things. So I think there is a good amount of research that needs to be done to kind of look into do people fundamentally respond differently to resistance training or is it all of these kind of external factors that kind of morph and manipulate the stimulus that seems to result in the greatest outcomes, but for purely from like a physiological level may not actually be different, if that makes sense. It's kind mm -hmm. of a hard topic to wrap your brain around, but it is it is different than saying that people just fundamentally respond differently to training. Um, and I think that is hard to answer with a lot of the current research. Um, obviously, from an individual level observation perspective, you, you know, people do well with very different approaches. But the question is, is it because people just tend to do well differently or is it the fact that it's actually assigning that difference in outcome to the actual different training approaches nutrition approaches etc i think that's an interesting conversation that probably just gets accepted at face value without a ton of critical thought which it's extremely enticing because like from a individual level observation perspective that seems abundantly clear but i think the thing that underlies differential individual outcomes is is probably more nuanced than maybe a lot of people think. So that is my, yeah, ran on that, but I'll stop talking now. <laughs> good thing. Good thing for us. We have your PhD coming through. <laughs> um, and uh, great points. And I think oftentimes when people try to interpret things from a certain lens that, you know, they think training to failure is, the most important variable to be taking into account, but they're also missing the other variables that are incredibly important to take into account when it comes to program design, whether it be your volume, whether it be your frequency, whether it be your exercise selection, exercise sequence, the list goes on. And um, my buddy Cass, who you're familiar with, uh, he has this um, principle of thresholds model and basically for each of the variables that can influence program design, you know, they all have a different hierarchy for um, how far you could push the needle for that individual variable. And um, I think the PhD is going to birth some uh, interesting thoughts and feelings in people, and I can't wait to see it. So when it comes to things such as fatigue, which is going to be influenced by volume and intensity. Um, do you think, and you recently put out the the post on deloading that I'm sure you're very familiar with. Um, do you think that taking a deload for a period of time is going to negatively influence things such as strength or hypertrophy? 
Yeah, so I think that 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 paper is tough for for a lot of reasons. I, I think the first thing to say is I, I think the the paper got a ton of unnecessary flack for um, maybe not mimicking exactly what people kind of think of intuitively when deloading. Um, I think the authors did an awesome job. I think that was a really hard study to run, and I think it's challenging to be the people that start a line of research, um, particularly in deloads when you're trying to kind of create that initial study where the two conditions differ a good amount you're literally playing with one week. So for everybody that was like, well, why didn't they do 75% of the volume like I do? I think from a researcher's perspective, that's such a small change to expect the difference between conditions that it gets harder to justify. That's the first thing I'll say about that, just to, just to give them uh, a shout out. I thought that was a really well done study. Um, that said, when you do take the, the limitation into account of how the deload actually looked, I do think that kind of explains the outcomes a, a good amount, particularly for strength. I think that... Um, you know, kind of losing touch with a with a, a movement pattern, um, particularly when you're not training with heavy loads. Um, I think the technique kind of threshold to use that example is a little bit higher than than what they were meeting. So that probably had them backslide and their load progression kind of got uh, halted a little bit. And I think that kind of those momentum things I think kind of can can occur when you're taking a week off. That said. Um, from a practical perspective, I don't think that's changed my position on deloads too much. I still think they're a very useful tool from you know a fatigue management perspective. I think the interesting thing comes down to what are you ultimately deloading for, and then ultimately how do you determine the frequency? I think those are the kind of the two biggest things. I think most people would agree from a practical perspective, like people are going to need an easier week every now and again. The the interesting things becomes like why are you deloading? Like some people kind of do it for physiological resensitization. Some people think it's purely a psychological kind of uh, thing where by taking a very easy week, you're going to be more reinvigorated for training and you're going to train much harder and that's going to result in positive outcomes. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a ton of defensible positions on kind of why we deload. But if we had answers to why we deload, I think that would kind of result in the frequency and then the way that we actually program them a little bit differently. Um, in terms of fatigue, I, I think that the biggest question I have is I don't know if fatigue kind of accumulates. It, it seems like it does, um, particularly this is coming from like a strength coaching perspective. I think, you know, just anecdotally, it seems like that is the case. And I think that's a good kind of rationale in, in some cases for deloading is you kind of accumulate training stress, whether that's through trying to increase the load weekly, increase the RP, what, what have you. And then you kind of just need to take a step back where you try to run up that ladder again. So um, that that seems to make sense to me from a practical perspective, but ultimately if I'm being intellectually honest, I don't really know, you know, answers to those questions. And I do think that would ultimately kind of shape how we end up with the output. I think the the thing I'm probably the most confident in is kind of that a proactive approach probably, uh, sorry, a reactive approach probably makes sense for most people. I think the nice thing about the, the underlying assumption that a reactive approach is that it's individualized. That's the key to me. And I think proactive approaches kind of get poo-pooed a lot, but I think that's because they're often not individualized. Coming from somebody who uses proactive deloading a decent amount, basically the way that I do it is, you know, you have a client, you maybe have them run a training phase for a couple weeks until the, till the point where it seems like their performance is starting to decline or they report symptoms that a deload needs to kind of happen. You, uh, you know, you kind of, you take that deload and then the next block, you're kind of roughly assuming that's going to be repeatable given that there's not very extraneous life scenarios. And so if you hit that point, maybe you just call the deload regardless of kind of, um, you know, if they're not screaming for a deload early or saying that they're 100% completely fresh and absolutely no fatigue is accumulated outside of those scenarios, maybe you kind of take a deload at a similar point because you would assume that pattern is going to be relatively repeatable over time. You want to kind of check that pattern every now and again, obviously, because it could be like a one-off thing, but I think that's a, a viable approach. So maybe like initially reactive, but then from there on proactive to some degree. Um, but I think for hypertrophy specifically, I think a, a reactive kind of approach can, can make total sense. And I think, again, I think the big thing there is you're just accounting for individual rates of fatigue rather than just slapping some three, one, uh, three up, one down paradigm on it without any uh, account for how the individual is actual interfacing on the training. Um, saying three up, one down, regardless of the volumes relative to what the, the individual is adapted to, the proximity to failure, the loading ranges, the exercise selection, all those things could be completely different that would result in different kind of fatigue patterns. So you know, in a relatively consistent setup where minor changes are going to be made, I think you can 
individualize pretty well proactive deloads and, and manage fatigue appropriately. But I think as a kind of a general principle, leaning on the reactive side probably makes sense because it's going to be individualized. So if you're given kind of a general recommendation to people broadly, I think that's probably the approach to move with. Yeah. Mm. Great points. For those of you who are unfamiliar about the paper we're referring to, um, Dr. Pack, one of the authors on the paper, was uh, previously on Anabolic Radio, and the lead author on the paper was Max Coleman. I believe in the paper there was a total of 39 participants, and um, results demonstrated that strength was impacted to a degree, whereas there was no significant changes in terms of hypertrophy. And um, for the deload intervention, they basically, like... Uh, like Zach said, they did no training for their deload intervention. And this is just one study, okay? And it's gonna birth many others, I'm sure, when it comes to deloading. And it's incredibly hard to get participants that are trained individuals that completely let you take over their training. So I'm excited to see future papers from that. And I think um, from a practical perspective, my thoughts with how I, um, pretty much structured deloads is based off the fitness fatigue model. And um, for some of my clients, I do take a, a proactive approach. And just given that time frame that we have, it's just to push the stimulus enough within that time frame. And then I also utilize re reactive approaches. I don't think, um, I, I tend to not be absolute with saying this one is better than the other, but um, both are incredibly beneficial for helping us um, dissipate some of that fatigue and it's interesting because we can't really measure fatigue right it's more of like subjective feelings how how's training going you know what do you have going on in your life and i think it's important to also look at the other variables that are going on in your life because our body can't really distinguish between different types of stressors it just sees it all through one lens of stress and uh, that's what's referred to as allostatic load so stress from your work life relationship training your body just sees it all as stress. And and stress is not an inherently bad thing. If it's the right dose over the right time frame, our body's able to adapt to that stressor and become stronger. And our resistance training is a great example of that. But what our body tends to struggle with is chronic stress over a long period of time. That's when we start to run into things such as reduced training performance, you know, lack of motivation, the list goes on. So um, I'd love to uh, round off this conversation. Do you have anything you would like to leave the audience with? No, oh, man, I think that uh, first and foremost, thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. This was a great conversation. Um, I think the thing I always just kind of like to close out on is just to, to underline once again, kind of some of the, the limitations and, and, and kind of pieces that are important to kind of keep in mind when interpreting the analysis. Like we mentioned, um, the RR estimation procedure kind of leaves us not really knowing the true accuracy of those estimations. Thus, that's kind of subject to change the overall modeling uh, relationship. In addition to like we talked about some of the just the subjectivities and kind of the model fitting procedures um, that kind of come along with evaluating the relationship overall. So we'd probably just want to view those as kind of the overall directionality of the outcomes and its relationship to RER without kind of over interpreting the exact relationship between each individual RERs when making uh, prescription. So those are the kind of the three main things. And then ultimately, I think that, um, like you said, kind of just taking a nice slow pace to kind of adopting evidence and how that changes practice is kind of just a good kind of thing to go by, particularly in this case where although it is a meta-analysis, which is generally viewed as kind of the, the top of the hierarchy of evidence, although that's kind of a, that, that could be a whole other podcast, but um it is just a, it's a, it's not standard in a lot of ways. Um, the 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 estimation procedures, the analytical approach, et cetera, just a lot of things that are not super standard. And I think it's important to give us some you know a framework to kind of evaluate proximity to failure through. But it's by far not going to be the last analysis on this topic. And I don't think it's the perfect analysis by any means. It's just getting us closer to what we have to work with and kind of using the tools at our uh, disposal to help us uh, help us get stronger and, and, and more jacked. So. We shall, we shall see if, uh, you know, hopefully the reporting and everything gets better as years go on. And I know um, quite a few authors that are that are working on some some stuff that will be, you know, raising the bar of what this area is kind of expected to report and how studies are going to be designed. So I'm excited for the next few years on this topic to, you know, we may come back, analyze the results with RER estimations that we're more, um, more uh, confident in, and it may completely change things. So we don't really know. Mm. Great points, great points. I want to thank you for coming on, Zach. Guys, 
If you like this episode, don't forget to comment, share, all that good stuff. Tag us with a screenshot on your stories. Go give Zach a follow on Instagram. And if you're a nerd, go check out the paper. And um, other than that, we'll talk soon, guys. Thanks for tuning in.